Hello, this is Eugen Tang. I'm coming from Fargo, North Dakota. I'm sitting with Representative uh, Ruth Buffalo, and um, this is day number three of my tour on how to reduce our carbon footprint by 100,000 tons a day by 2030. So, Ruth, could you please uh, just tell the audience a little bit about who you are and kind of how you got to where you uh, well where you are right now? Sure. Nido shadzi nakwaga o madashi mia adeshheads ma be sigids ma sigidads nakwaga o um, I'm Ruth Buffalo. I carry my late grandmother Ruth's Hidadza name. A woman appears in her English name. Um, I'm originally from Mandaree, uh, which is located on the western side of the state. The western side. Yep, okay. right al um, along the Missouri River. Okay. And uh, we're coming to you from the what is known as the Red River Valley on the opposite side of uh, where I grew up from. So uh, opposite we're, we're side right of now the we're state. in the Red River Valley? Yep, right okay. now we're in the eastern side of North Dakota in the Red River Valley, um, the original homelands of the Dakota people, and then years later the Anishinaabe people. Um, but I am a citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara nation. Um, and we also have stories of um, congregating at the headwaters of the Red River. Um, which would be by Bre Breckenridge and Wapiton, so south of here. South? Of yeah, south we're of one of um, two rivers in the nation, uh, in this area that flows north. So oh, okay. further downstream, so to speak, which is north of here, is Grand Forks and then uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg, okay, yeah. okay, very cool. And how did you, like, kind of, how did you start getting into politics in North Dakota and becoming a representative? Mm, I would say um, really from just being observant um, at a young age, like okay. seeing things when I was a little girl, seeing stuff, experiencing things that that weren't good. You know, like for example, one of my, I'm a big sister in my family, and okay. so we, we are matriarchal, matrilineal people as well. And so I, I think that is part of, it's in my DNA to want to help others, protect others. And so That's saw, awesome. yeah, I saw, a, our broken healthcare system when I was a little girl and I didn't realize that's what it was but we almost lost one of my younger sisters at the time oh no. misdiagnosed at our local field clinic and um, so that led me on a path to want to make things better at home and I set out to become a medical doctor back then okay you set out to become a medical doctor yeah okay. yep but then um, actually went to school across the river here in Concordia in Moorhead okay. Um, but realized I couldn't work on cadavers right before my senior year, so I had to like switch gears and okay. so okay. Um, so yeah, I, I just from growing up on a reservation, Indian reservation, really out in the country, rural area, and um, you know the people there are good people, beautiful land, and just really wanted to find ways to help live, help people live longer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like kind of like you're coming from a place of like, you know, I saw all of these things kind of like that were going wrong when I was a kid and, and now I want to help and, and yep. do that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is obviously about climate stuff. So can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, your experience and like with things that have either gone wrong or right in your lifetime with climate change and like, um, yeah, things like that. Yeah. I mean, like I think back to my childhood on the res and at Mandarin school and, um, I used to always win our, our science projects, like our science, science project okay, competition. Cool. <laughs> so, yeah, so one year I did one on the ozone layer and I was always really like creative in my little models that I would show and things. So I guess it was kind of art too <laughs> mixed in there. But yeah. yeah, I remember doing a science project um, in grade school on CFCs, like chlorofluorocarbons oh, and the yeah. ozone layer. And yeah, you know, yeah. I've um, heard about that. Yeah, so, but, um, Fast forward, I would say to uh, 2010, 2010. Um, 11, Early 2009. Um, Around the 2010 era. Yeah, okay. that's where we saw uh, firsthand the impacts of the oil industry or the extractive industry in Western North Dakota. Okay. My home community, it's not a town, it's not a township or anything, it's just a community of about community. seven, 790 people. 790. After oh, that's pretty small. Population. But that, that um, grew, that size, it got to 790 um, from the oil boom. From, from the oil boom. People relocating to work there because there's money there. Ah, how big um, was it before? Probably 340, 400-ish, you So know? more than doubled in size. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. crazy. And okay. it's not only uh, 
non-natives, but natives from different tribal communities all moved to Mandaree. It was Mandaree. known as the heart of the Bakken oil formation. The heart of the Bakken oil formation? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So the Bakken oil formation is in the western side of the state, western North Dakota, and there's about um, 19, I would say. I could be wrong. Somewhere in the teens, 19 uh, oil company, oil, oil oil counties, companies. oil counties. 19 oil counties. Yeah. Wow, in the okay. western side of the state. Yeah. And so Fort Berthold has seven counties that intersect it, that cross its uh, boundaries. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, Fort Berthold Indian Reservation is about a million acres of land. Would be more had the Pix Loan Act not flooded 94% of our I agricultural land. I heard about that. Land. That was yeah. so like, yeah, that's so yeah. like, that's messed up. Yeah. So um, at that time, you know, I was uh, working, teaching, coaching at a tribal college in Bismarck, um, okay. but my entire family still lives at Fort Berthold. So we would go home a lot back and forth, but um, I would spend my summers there during the second oil boom it's referred to as. The second um, oil boom? Okay. Yeah, I used to lead my tribes, my tribal nation, tribal government summer youth employment program for four consecutive summers, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. Okay. So saw a lot of things there, um, saw a lot of devastation. Uh, and so where things are at today, um, there's a lot of drugs there, a lot of uh, overdoses, drug overdoses. Yeah like everywhere else in the country, but when you think of our population size uh, to begin with and how we got to about like 1% of the U.S. population, that's through poor policies and genocide, right. but another story another day, but it's all connected. Um, so yeah, but prior to, uh, so in 2014, I was here at NDSU, grad school student, and okay. so I would get asked by um, elder women from Mandaree to, to go back to Dickinson on the western side of the state. Oh, I stopped and, by there on my drive. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. They had like a, a bureau land management hearing there one winter, one spring winter. Um, it was still cold out and still snow, like we get snow out here probably nine months out of the year, but. Oh, wow, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, so um, I would travel over, provide testimony, um, and then come back you know, and go to class the next day. But so I got involved with seeing um, the, the the landscape change, you know, uh, so many different flares, like in the sky, that you look at the skyline. Flares? Yeah, what like the? um, it's, uh, it's connected with the fracking process. So it's like a, a byproduct of fracking. So it, it's uh, connected to a fracking, uh, I used to know all this terminology, like by you know, yeah, pretty yeah, well yeah. versed at one time. Because I, um, through studying public health, I really uh, dove deep into like the environmental health classes that we had, and um, wanted to learn more. Did a lot of research on on methane flaring, and so methane flaring it has a lot of harmful chemicals in it. They still won't release the exact chemicals that are being released into the air. They, like or, they won't like tell us. Yeah, or even in fracking yeah like in it also goes back to like different tribal administrations um every tribal chair has a four-year term okay and so things change you know under each different administration but i remember and i could be wrong it could be different today but i remember the people wanted to know what exactly is in these chemicals yeah but, me too but leadership was was more on the side of like you don't really need you don't need to know and there were pictures circulating social media where oil companies were going to Mandaree School uh, with, you know, big jars of fracking uh, wastewater and frack, you know, the, the chemicals saying, showing the kids like, this is what you would be working with as if it was like kind of normalizing it. <laughs> what? Yeah. So it was really, it's, it's a different thing. So where it is today, there's a lot of these oil companies have sponsored uh, giving iPads to children in schools. They've uh, they've built like a Head Start building and has their name on there, Crestwood, you know, or whichever oil company. So it's they're kind of um, integrating themselves into the community. And I get that that this new development or not new development, but fracking provides um, opportunities and uh, some sense of self-sufficiency away from the federal government because really tribes were at one time 
considered wards of the government, you know, and then treaty after treaty were broken, um, and the money allotted to tribal nations is not enough to really survive on. It's basically crumbs um, with the notion or the stereotype that we get free health care. Well, if you look at the health care we, we're given, it's crumbs. It's um, They have this thing, this program called Purchase, um, Purchase? PR, PRC, Purchase and Referred Care Program. Purchase so, and Referred Care Program. Like the end of October, it, the budgets are shrinking, you know, because then it turns over to a new uh, fiscal year. Okay. And so they would joke and say it's either life or limb. Like you, you can't get referred out on the res. You go to one of your field clinics and say, you know, you're sick. You need to be referred out to, you know, off res hospital, one of higher care. Um, you either have to be on your deathbed or have lost a limb in order for them to refer you out, you know, so that's wild And then that program has never been fully funded either. So there's a lot of um, Misleading information out there and I don't think that our elected leaders know this information um, Even at the federal level even at the some do and I give them credit and, and uh, commend them but even at the state level there's conversations still even in house floor debates where people colleagues of mine will say well I thought everybody got free free health care you know but they don't, they don't but know. but then it's very subpar I mean so so I get that tribes favor or see oil as an opportunity to help their people oh. but at the same time what, what kind of baseline data do we have for the health implications for people who live a half mile or under next to a fracking well site, a fracking pad? I forget what exactly it's called, a fracking well site? I think fracking, but it's a fracking site. It's a fracking site. Yeah, it's a fracking site. <laughs> um, because my mom, my whole family, they live within a half a mile from these sites, you know, and. And I'm concerned. I have little twin, I, twin I'm nephews. Concerned. Yeah. You know, um, and what are the long-term effects? Hopefully, nothing. Hopefully, you know. But at the same time, you can't really trust that someone is looking out for your best interests, your for your health, because without our health, you have nothing. You have nothing. Yeah. You have nothing. So. Wow. That's. I mean, that's a lot of. That's a lot. I didn't even know that there was like so much stuff happening in this North Dakota side. I didn't like. I heard about the flooding like um, uh, earlier this morning actually. But the fracking thing, like, that's crazy. Um, okay. Well, it's, it's very um, kind of a polarized topic because North Dakota, the political landscape here is it's very red state, very oil, pro-oil, pro-energy, pro-coal. And so, um, but we also have to look at the social implications as well. You know, um, with more money comes more... <laughs> problems you know right right right, right. <laughs> like uh, literally i mean more crime more drugs um and uh, to the best of my knowledge we're still very short staffed with law enforcement um you have like 100 million i mean 1 million acres to cover and oftentimes and that's six different communities oftentimes there there's not enough officers to cover that large of an area so a lot of times in the past communities were often left to fend for themselves wow. and predators uh, drug dealers know that you know if they I read an article recently it was in the USA today it was really a sad article because we, we know you know the people in the article who were affected the locals you know from them? yeah oh wow yeah and so um, of losing loved ones to the opioid crisis or the ep, you know epidemic crisis, so yeah, yeah and um, so it's it's a hard thing and hopefully we can get to a place where we have all of this under control but I still feel like it's not <laughs> yeah. it's not anywhere where we need to be yeah um, yeah I mean there's definitely a lot to be done uh, can like what can you speak to what you think um, the future direction of like how we can how we can come and like you know do things that are good for the environment can you speak to like a little bit about what you think the future direction of like climate change climate activism environmental activism kind of is yeah i mean i'm not an expert by any means i mean sure. i've i was invited from remember that that blm hearing i testified in dickinson then a year later i got asked to go to congress in dc to lobby different 
congressional members on the methane flaring rule. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. they they then asked me to um, the same night after we had our briefing with all these other people from across the country um, in our group. Then they asked me later after the meeting was done. Well, will you um, present tomorrow at a um, Senate briefing and I was oh, like wow <laughs> somebody missed their flight and they needed someone to okay. fill in so I was like okay but um, <laughs> it, it, all my old PowerPoints from grad school and public health came in I they were there because I there? did it on the topic oh wow flaring. so you were like prepared yeah nice. I mean it, yeah, it was just like do I condense it or you know but um, so I mean I've, I've had that experience but it's still like it's only one piece to the puzzle so I, I see a lot of our young people are really fear uh, fearless and that's good like they're they're uh, not afraid to take action and so that's what we need we need to that is what we need, yeah. yeah we need to honor our young people um, and their their voices because they're like you said they're gonna they, they're gonna be left with this mess you yes. know <laughs> um, and so it's important to listen to the youth, you listen to the elders. Um, I know I've, I've seen, watched different um, indigenous women uh, probably a couple years ago do a campaign internationally to oh, internationally. visit wow. um, banks, banks. Like, uh, who were funding these extract, extractive industry oh, okay, projects, okay. Okay, you know, and so that's a good, good way to raise awareness and to make people understand who is being impacted by Who's being impacted the, this development because I mean if there's a way to find a good balance you know we should do that I think because um, it's it's I think we're at a point where it, it really just screams greed you know and, and we're <laughs> yeah. not like yeah. considering yeah. the people who are being impacted directly I mean you see it through like Capitalism. environmental racism everything yeah, wow. yeah yeah and so and people w would say well that term is outdated it's really environmental genocide you know and, and environmental I, genocide I agree okay. yeah wow. so it's there's a lot you know that um, that we need to do and so I think everybody has a role everybody has different strengths and so everybody should should feel welcome to take action big or small um, and just support one another for sure yeah, yeah. everyone should definitely take action big or small um wow yeah thank you for that enlightening you've you've told me so many things in this interview i'm gonna have to go like write this down and like uh -huh. remember it because um i'm gonna have to add all this to my next book um if there's one thing that our viewers could do or could take away from this interview um what do you think that would be ruth mm, just to Gosh, one thing to take away from this interview that that each of us has a responsibility. Each of us has a responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that that would be it. I think it. just yeah. Awesome, amazing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ruth. Yeah. Once again, this is Eugene Tang coming from Fargo, North Dakota, with Representative Ruth Buffalo, and um, oh, I still haven't come up with a conclusion, so I'm just getting the video.